group. So as we get into this, you can see uh, that these are there. Anybody uh, got any immediate ideas of what argument about the greatest you're going to make? Yeah, Samba. NBA player. Makes sense. You're a basketball guy. You get to pick LeBron. All right, cool. You can make an actual LeBron argument now that he won the bubble. It took a while, but he got there. That's kind of how the greatest works, though. One of the things I want you to pay attention to is this is supposed to be some kind of GOAT argument. Greatest of all time. So, like, if Samba's writing about LeBron and Michael Jordan, don't forget Bill Russell won 11 NBA championships in 13 seasons. Just because it was a different time period doesn't mean he doesn't have a critical, like, claim for that. They didn't even keep block shots when he was playing. Stats aren't really there. But he did play every game for 13 seasons wearing Converse, Chuck Taylor All-Stars, and LeBron sleeps in a hyperbaric chamber, so Bill Russell must have been a real tough dude. But uh, what other kind of arguments are you thinking about making? Yeah. The greatest musician. Greatest musician. You're picking Connor Oberst? Me too. Now, who are you going to pick? Jimmy Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix, this is certainly a, an argument you could build there. We've got other ones we're gonna make. One of the reasons why I'm asking this is I'm gonna talk through these six skills, and if you like throw yours out there, there's a good chance if I know anything about it, I will talk about it, yeah. Um, Bird Russell. And who's your pick? The ultimate warrior? Uh, Jordan Burroughs. Jordan Burroughs, who we established yesterday. I don't really know about, but he's got a good, oh, I still don't remember, double leg something. Double, double. double. yeah. Last double. Last double wrestling terms, I don't know. We got other ones? If not, we'll talk through them and you can have your own ideas and some of you are like, I don't really want to speak up. You'll talk to people on Monday. Sure. Does it have to be a person? Like, what, what's your idea? I don't have an idea, I'm just thinking. Generally, it's easier if it's a person. Like, could it be about like a car if you wanted? It could be the greatest car of all time or the greatest team or band or you just as long as you're making some argument about the greatest because then you're gonna have to have historical context that's fine if you come up with something else to be honest I mean I've known you for two days I trust that you'll probably do this in a useful way that'll be good for you and that's the goal of the assignment right everything in here is for you yeah two pages and you can always find that info here that's one of the reasons why this is useful on blackboard so you got to talk about quantitative and qualitative evidence from at least three sources. Um, it's got to be two pages, double space, Times New Roman, size 12 font, submitted by via Blackboard before class on Monday. If it's late, how much off am I going to take? 50%. So don't start 20 out of 40. Put the shovel away, right? Don't dig yourself a hole. Get out a hammer and let's build something. Um, go to uh, the greatest assignment. You'll click on that. It's a hyperlink. It'll tell you again when it's due, how many points there are. It'll give you the directions again. And then you can either click, click write submission, which I'd prefer you don't do because it'll show up all wonky. Or like if you type this in Word or Google Docs or please not pages either. Why not pages? Because then I have to get out my phone or my iPad to look at it. You'll break up my rhythm grading. I like to get in the zone like I'm just doing a three-point contest. Um, but... If you go browse local files, you can click on it, then you'll click on your submission, you hit uh, open, um, it'll put it down here and go, all right, there it is. And then you just click submit and it'll go to me. It says it's not saved because I'm not enrolled as a student in the course, so I can't submit work. I am enrolled as a student in the course. It's my other Blackboard account, Addison. It's top secret, I'll use it if you try to plagiarize other people's work, then send it to me as an email then I'll submit it from my own account and I'll see that you cheated and I'll ruin your life. I might not ruin your life, but you get kicked out of Waldorf. Tough. And they might do it. All right, so do your own work. This should be fun anyway. So today we're talking about uh, these six skills and where I got these six skills are from this dude named Lionel Calder. I mean, he's a historian and one of the reasons he came up with this is there's a lot of different things we can learn about in history. 1877. That's a long period of time. A lot of stuff happened. And I think that can be really daunting if I'm like, I don't know, anybody from another country feeling nervous about American history? You're not, you know, scary. Your history kind of intertwined with ours, maybe, but 
that is an intimidating thing, right? Or maybe you're just like a person that really hasn't enjoyed history in the past. It's not something you find interesting. Whatever, I think this gives you an opportunity to focus on skill development. Also, these six skills, I think, are very important to anything you're gonna do in life. These are big picture thinking skills that'll help you win any argument you're gonna be in in the future. Will help you better understand the world around you, make you a better citizen person, probably an employee, whatever you're gonna go into also. So like, one of the reasons why I put this into the class and structure it this way is because I realized, looking out, none of you are majoring in history yet, but I still want this to be a beneficial class to you as you work over the next 16 weeks. And the, practicing these skills, I promise you, can make you better at looking at the world around you. So as we look at this, Calder developed this, it's called a signature pedagogy, anybody an education major? Pedagogy, right? Thinking about how we make other people learn stuff, what we're putting into the class. So this is a construct designed to provide a framework for historical thinking. It can be applied to almost uh, or any historical situation or event. I've applied this to all sorts of things, so you're gonna apply it to a non-historical argument. I mean, they are kind of historical if you're talking about the greatest of all time. That's why I put the time parameter on it, right? There's six aspects of historical thinking, and these are gonna be the basis of the entire class. So if this is worth your time today and to get this assignment, some good practice in, right? This is your first foray with using this in a way that you should be able to use it pretty easily because I bet Samba knows about LeBron James. You're from Ohio, just another kid from Ohio, how to do great things. But another reason, when you get to our midterm exam, I'm gonna give you like three or four options of things we've talked about so far and tell you to just write one paragraph about each of these aspects, that's your exam related to that historical situation. I'll also give you the topics in advance so you can pick one that's like firmly in your wheelhouse and knock it out of the park because I don't know, why wouldn't I do that? Just like, it could be anything from the whole class. That'd be wild. You have to study so much stuff and I would get a good idea of like how you can actually use these skills, which is what I care about. Um, so, all right, without further ado, um, our first skill is gonna be evaluating evidence. And our definition is gonna be determining what sources are most accurate and applicable. And why I have this first in here, it's not first on your sheet because it takes a lot of space and I didn't look at the PowerPoint when I was putting together the sheet. Whatever, they're all there. You're gonna have to do all six of them. But determining what sources are most accurate and applicable is really important because of your own credibility when you're putting together your work. Now, I don't know. Mr. Hall, you play baseball. I remember, because I saw your mom on Facebook every game. It's very hot out. She give us the weather and then how it went. But it's how I followed four cities baseball season all season, which is great. And it's also great if mom likes sports. She's the best. But if you were gonna make an argument about the greatest baseball player of all time, you'd probably have a pretty good take. I'd probably have a pretty good take too, maybe. Like I know some things about baseball. But if we went to somebody that, like that was their whole job, like the guy that runs baseballreference.com, he might have a better idea. Or even like, I was gonna say Alex Rodriguez, but I hate that guy. Um, I don't know, if you're Tim Kirkjian, you probably have an idea of how to make that argument. He has greater credibility than you or I. Somebody's making that argument, they appeal to him instead of me or you. Probably go like, ah, he probably knows what he's talking about a little bit more. Same way that like, any, anything we could do this, we'd get it familiar. Like, if I go when uh, women's wrestling's at home, what's the date? You got it memorized. Mm -hmm. See, you know, because there's only one, right? When I show up and watch you wrestle, come back to school on Monday, and I'll go like, good job. I'll know if you won or lost. I'll even maybe kind of know how it went, because like you can watch, and you can almost watch anything and kind of see how it's going, and go like, okay, clearly here's some of the good things, some of the bad things. But, like, if it was, me talking about uh, your match or Coach Gilder, who's, whose advice are you putting more stock in? Yeah, because that's his job. I'm just a person checking it out. And this is a thing that like our society's quit doing as much because we all have the internet and we all think everybody cares about what we think. So like we could go on the internet and be like, I don't know, pick any topic in the entire world and go on Twitter right now and somebody that doesn't have any expertise will be talking about it. Don't listen to those people. We were talking about this yesterday. Don't take advice from people that, uh, don't take criticism from people you wouldn't take advice from. The idea of like, also when you're doing your research, don't cite stuff or look at stuff that, 
why would one of the things I'm going to ask myself when I look at the sources you put in is, well, why should I listen to that piece of evidence? And you should be asking yourself that question, not just in this class, but in everything you're doing. We have four factors evaluating evidence. These can be useful for a couple of different things. They can help us understand motivation and bias, which I think is really important. Because like, if we look at our first factor, political factors, action related government policy and its administrative practices, I think this one's easy to understand in terms of bias. If you look at a pamphlet for gun control from the Republican Party and a pamphlet on gun control from the Democratic Party, are they going to say the same thing? Probably not, because they have different political motivations. Personally, I think I should be able to drive to work in a tank every day. They say no. The Second Amendment, it's supposed to protect us from the governmental tyranny. How am I going to fight the government? Like, I have a lot of guns, but they have way more. They have stealth bombers, nuclear missiles, tanks. Warships. Anyway, that's a different point we can talk about when we get to the Constitution of the United States. But this idea that I think we understand that political factors influence people's motivations and people's biases. I think we all know these people. Like if you've been on the internet in the last six months, even like seeps into everything. It's in the Waldorf COVID regulation meetings. People had definite political biases on display based on where they get their information. That's why evaluating evidence is important. Because if you're only getting one side, you're not going to get the whole picture and it undermines your credibility. Does that make sense? Economic factors, I think these are straightforward. If somebody's trying to sell you something, they'll give you the hard pitch. Waldorf admissions, this is their job. It's the greatest place in the universe. Your sales pitch is better if you like actually like tell people the truth. Here's the things of why this would be great for you personally. Anyway, economic factors are important. Uh, this is where in Latin we say qui bono, right? Who benefits? We want to look at uh, who stands to benefit from whatever it is. And that can uh, look at all sorts of different things. People that are trying to sell you something, that's going to influence uh, their arguments. And when you're looking at sources, you should see what was their motivation. Because if their motivation is to make money versus just pursuing what we call academic truth here in the academy, it's probably going to turn out a little bit differently. The other two are social and cultural factors, which a lot of times will become intertwined for us because in life, that's sometimes how it goes. It's not a coincidence. Three of our hockey guys are sitting in a row right there. They're the only people I know. <laughs> sure. And you know them because of how people organize their relationships and groups based on you have uh, some common traditions, I'm sure. You speak a common language. I mean, we all at least uh, speak English to some extent, but I think there's like an extra special set of hockey language that you can get, you just watch Letter Kenny, you learn it all. You know. um, but the idea that like, we know how this works. So we align ourselves in social groups a lot of times, and this is something you should like try to push yourself outside of this zone. This is my personal opinion, not my professional opinion, but the idea that like, make weird friends with different values and beliefs than you, not only is it fun to fight them about everything, it's also going to stretch you as a person and help you learn about the world around you and help you better empathize with other human beings and understand what's going on. And I think when we get in these echo chambers, this is what's happening to, I think, a lot of older people in particular on the internet. They say something crazy, and then the other people that share their exact same beliefs and values give it the thumbs up. And then it further entrenches those beliefs instead of challenging and getting to know somebody that's a little bit different than you and trying to understand these other positions. The other reason why you want to understand the other side is you make a more effective argument if you cut them out of their knees because you know what they're going to say. It's like, oh, here's your main point. <laughs> here's the answer to that. Anyway, I think we get this, the idea that like we have uh, beliefs, values, traditions, laws, and languages. Um, these are important things to consider uh, because things written from a certain uh, social or cultural uh, perspective, that'll change the evidence as well. We just want to be thinking about the kinds of things we're bringing in and how they can build our expertise. All right, so we got one skill. Why is this also important? I mean, these three things I think are all useful to think about this. If somebody only gives you one perspective, you might miss the entirety of the story of what's actually happening. Because a lot of times people will do this. Um, wild news story out of Des Moines, Iowa over the last week. Anybody seen this? Teacher in the Des Moines school system killed himself. And he's a really important person. Um, his name is Chris. I know lots of people who he positively impacted their lives about Central Campus. Um, but he started Run 515, um, which was uh, a group to empower youth in the inner city to uh, 
create things. Um, they started breakdancing groups and slam, a slam poetry team that just won the national championship earlier this summer and like did a lot of good things for this community. And so when he died, he knows my brother pretty well and I was like, this sucks. Yesterday I'm scrolling through Twitter and I see KCC out of Des Moines. Des Moines teacher who killed himself after he was put on administrative leave for having an inappropriate relationship with a student. Oh my God, shit. I couldn't have seen the whole story. The evidence wasn't there yet. I did have to roll back through my tweets. I was gonna delete the poem I retweeted that he had written. Somebody else had already deleted the initial tweet. Anyway, the internet's forever, I guess. Perspective will also change things. Um, that's why I put these pictures in here. You got a penguin and giraffe and swan and elephant and whatever. That's a seal for sure. I don't know if it's a goat or something. Um, but the idea that like when you look at things from a different direction, sometimes it's going to change how you see things. And I think that's really important to how we look not at just at historical subjects. When you're making arguments, if Samba writes all about LeBron James and you don't buy, mention Michael Jordan once, I'll probably sink your battleship like LeBron began. Because you could also make some of the counterpoints, you could see that other perspective and you can bring that evidence in yourself. The other one is the idea that like, we get misrepresentations of some things sometimes. People will present the wrong evidence in order to give us an incorrect picture where like we don't truly understand the reality. We were talking, this is why we got in such a long conversation yesterday, at least partially we are talking about perception versus reality. The idea that sometimes we perceive the world how we want to see it versus how things really are. And that's one of the things that I want us to be thinking about is the idea like this man's starving at the bottom of a hole. This guy looks like he's helping, but he's got the ladder. You just help him out. And sometimes evidence is like that. People will write things specifically to advance their own viewpoint. And if we can't pick that apart and evaluate evidence critically, we're not going to be able to see through the bullshit. And there's going to be a lot of bullshit you're going to confront in life. See, I already swore more times than last hour, but they were all so proud of me. What a letdown. All right, our next skill is historical significance. This seems really easy on the surface. I'll call this the big why when we talk about it. Why events are relevant and important to uh, modern scholars or how events are relevant and important to modern scholars. The modifier doesn't really change here. Why do we still care today? Why is this something that we're talking about? Especially in a class where you talk about anything in American history to 1877. Why do we care about LeBron James versus Michael Jordan? Because Skip Bayless needs to feed his family. So you can argue with Stephen A on first take. Um, the idea that like, I know Max Kellerman's on there now, but I'm old. Max has done that too. Stephen A's forever though. I remember he's the beat writer for the uh, Philadelphia 76ers. And I just thought he was the most fired columnist in the entire world. And his life worked out all right, because he's pretty good at what he did. Why do we care? And this seems really easy because like eh, most of this we can like take a glance and go like well the american civil war matters because it was the largest uh, war in terms of human casualties in the united states and largely led to the end of uh, american slavery pretty important and most people would say that or understand that but we have to be able to see the whole picture and use these other skills to truly get this and understand the nuance and complexity and really see all the parts of the picture for what they are so like when we do this, it's easy on the surface. This will a lot of times be your introduction and conclusion to things. Why do we care? And then again, at the end, you're gonna reassert why you care, why we should care, why your point matters. But when we do this, just be careful that you gotta understand the other pieces before you're gonna see the whole picture. All right, our next skill is historical agency and contingency. The ability of a single individual or group to shape the outcomes of a historical situation. Anybody make bad decisions? Me, drinking six cups of coffee, coming to this class on Wednesday. We all make bad decisions, right? Nobody's perfect. That's an important thing to think about with historical agency, because when we look at people in the past, sometimes we want to just like, be like, well, George Washington was perfect. That's not fair to him. I wouldn't want to, if I came up here and told you a long story, I told you my whole life story. I was born on a hot summer's day in 1988. It's just this triumphant story where I never did anything wrong over the last 33 years. Would you walk out of here being like, that's a great guy, but that's a real egotistical jerk? 
you'd probably go like, oh, you know that story wasn't all the way true, because nobody's life is perfect like that. And so when we talk about people in the past, we got to make sure that we're looking at that and giving them that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. What, but when we make bad decisions, and if you think about a specific bad decision you've made, then think about the consequences. The things people do matter. And that's true in history also. People make specific decisions in moments that reshape the entire course of history. Early 1960s, Montgomery, Alabama. The young pastor, he's the new pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, um, and uh, they're going to start this bus boycott. And women drove the bus boycott. One of them refused to give a receipt on the bus. I bet you know her name. Anybody got the Sunday school answer? Rosa Parks. All right, we got one. I thought somebody was going to say Claudette Colvin, who actually refused to give up her seat on the bus a little bit earlier, but she was 16 years old and pregnant, so they were like, not going to be good at NAACP testing. That's for another class. We'll talk about that in 202. If you take that class, we'll go way deep in civil rights because that's a thing I find very interesting. But everybody comes together, this church, and they're trying to find somebody to lead this bus boycott, right? And as they do this, a couple of the older guys start arguing with each other. I should be in charge. No, you should be in charge. And you're like, no, nah, I should be in charge. They go like, ah, oh, well, here's this young guy. We'll put him in charge, then we can all influence him. <laughs> they bet wrong, though. Well, or right. It kind of depends on how you look at it. But they picked Martin Luther King Jr., fresh out of seminary. Turned out, he had some historical agency. He brought this whole doctrine of nonviolence. When somebody threw a literal bomb into his house where I would have, like, come outside shooting, he came outside and told everybody to calm down and that things were going to be fine and that if we push back against them with violence, we're going to undercut the entire movement. That's not exactly what he said, to paraphrase, but I think you get the point. The decisions people make in moments, especially difficult moments like that, really matter in the course of history. Um, when we uh, kind of see this, this is how I want you to think about it. The groups are important too, because we got to understand all the stakeholders in a situation. Who's there? What do they think about it? Because if we continue with our Montgomery bus boycott example, we couldn't do our progress and decline skill, which we're going to talk about in a minute, without thinking about, well, yeah, a lot of people did support this movement. A lot of people had to buy in. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Abernathy, all sorts of other people had to come together to make this movement work. But there were also other people who fought against this movement, otherwise you wouldn't have to have a movement. They wore pointy hats, they burned crosses in people's yards, they shot at the buses, all sorts of things. We gotta identify all the groups so we can truly understand complexity. So when we look at this, there are some problems or things you wanna keep in mind. The first is what uh, kind of academics typically call great man theory. And I know it's uh, overly gendered, but hopefully they'll write a new paper soon and they'll change some things. But this idea that sometimes in the past, we take people and we build them up into something in their, in their mind that they're not. You ever do this with somebody? My wife has accused me of this, uh, we were at this wedding ran into my ex-girlfriend, my last girlfriend before my wife. Her name's Hannah, she sucked, she's very mean. No, she was all right. If I put myself in her shoes, she probably had a lot going on, whatever. But like, we ran into each other, our voices just kept getting higher and higher, like you when you're lying to somebody because you're having a weird social interaction, like, hey, how are you, this is going great, oh my God. And like, we walked away and I was like, why would you even talk to her? She was so, so terrible to you. I was like, nah, things are pretty good. Because sometimes in the past, we like cloud things over, right? And we try to make things out better than they are. Great man theory, we do that in history sometimes too. This has been a point of some debate over the summer where like a lot of people want to tell this really triumphant version of history that cuts out all of the bad things. And like what I was saying, like if we talk about ourselves, we don't ever like put our, like own the stuff that makes us flawed human beings. It's not very credible or believable or anything else. So we want to try like, also, I would never want people to put that on me. If you're a person in the past, you deserve to be seen as a human being that also made mistakes. Because a lot of times our mistakes put us in a position to become the people we are, to do the great things that we do. So let's do that with people in the past also. Like, I bet if LeBron could go back, LeBron's tough though, because he's like made most all of the right decisions in a row forever. Like that's why I hate when people like get on LeBron, because even as a Michael Jordan person. He's the most fun person to watch during my adult life play basketball. And also off the court, he's been a great person. Yeah. And that's cool. 
I bet if you could go back, he might not do the not one, not two, not three, the whole Miami thing when he got there on TV. I bet he would maybe do that a little bit differently. Everybody makes mistakes. <sighs> Memory heroes. This is another thing. It's kind of tied in. The idea of like, you guys know that Albert Bell's the greatest baseball player of all time? Seven-year-old me would have made that argument very compellingly. Some of you might do this on this assignment, but please avoid it. People do this with visit musicians a lot. They'll go like, well, this person is the most important musician to me, therefore they're the greatest of all time. Like, sometimes it works out. Like, Nas is the greatest rapper of all time, and he's my personal favorite. So you're like, no. Just think about the idea that Nas has now put out really good albums that have charted in four consecutive decades. That's wild to think about. That's a 40 year run. Well, it's not necessarily 40 year run, it's like more like 30, because Illmatic came out in the 90s, but like mid 90s. I don't even know what that is. Nas, ah, oh, King's Disease 2 dropped a couple weeks ago. It's great. Maybe I'm just an old person and a lot of your young people's rap music. No, I'm still, I'm still on it. Show up in the Nyack gym when I'm doing the PA. I will play all the new hits. No. I keep up on things relatively well for somebody that's getting older and older by the day. But Albert Bell, when I was seven years old, I went to the Metrodome. Anybody been to the Metrodome? You guys are too young, they blew it up. Oh, I'll keep that Great. So in the Metrodome, I was sitting in right field. Albert Bell was playing for the Cleveland baseball team that should be called the Spiders, but it's about to be called the Guardians. And I was yelling at him, little seven-year-old boy, hey! Turns around, waves at me. Plus, I was also like chubby kid, and he was kind of a chubby guy, and he just became my greatest hero. It'd be dumb if I made an argument that he was the greatest baseball player of all time, and none of you have ever heard of him. We all know Barry Bonds was the greatest baseball player of all time, but he cheated, so he gets murky with baseball. Barry Bonds is a terror, though. So memory heroes work like that, right? Just because somebody meant a lot to you personally, you gotta sift that out if you're gonna make these types of arguments about the greatest. Um, minimized populations are really important, especially as we talk about history. We've all heard this saying, I'm sure, history is told by the victors. Powerful people tend to be the people that have time and ability and resources to write about themselves, or about their culture, or about their society, and sometimes, when they do that, they minimize other groups. In American history to 1877, we're gonna see this a lot, particularly with women. There are a lot of really important women in the early republic that we're gonna talk about that normally get lost in the shuffle as we talk about a group called the Founding Fathers. We look at some of these things that are happening, that's because social and cultural constructs maybe put women into a different sphere that we're gonna talk about in this class. But as we go through some of this, it's easy. There's also groups that weren't able to preserve their history because of circumstance. I'm pretty easy when we go through this class. I could, I could teach this entire class. We could talk about the, the expansion of the United States and the Western frontier. And the only time I could talk about Native Americans would be like at the Battle of Little Bighorn. There's been a minimized population. Their voice hasn't been heard in a lot of different ways. We really see that in Iowa's history. That's one of the things that's most important to me in the entire world. I just spent the last five years writing a book about it, about how the Dakota lived in Iowa, and that's not even radical. But nobody has written about that because nobody cared, spent the time to do it, I don't know. But this idea that we have minimized populations, and sometimes like when we start to amplify these voices, there's pushback, but the idea that like, you're never gonna understand the whole story unless you bring everybody to the table. We have to see these complexities. We have to account for these different groups, and that's why these groups are needed to see important. Villainization is also important. Uh, the idea that sometimes, uh, like Tony Montana, right, say goodnight to the bad guy. The idea that people get turned into villains, and then we kind of run them down. I'm sure we've all talked trash about somebody we didn't like in our life at some point in time. I do it about a women's basketball coach at Waldorf regularly, but I'm trying to be better. Not my fault, she got 14% winning percentage in seven games. That doesn't make her a bad person. I shouldn't villainize her. She's doing her best, and they're gonna be better this year. It's also not good for them, they gotta play before you all, and you guys are gonna be really good this year. 
I heard that run last night was uh, pretty good. I heard the run last night was pretty good. But I think we understand how villainization works because it's really easy in our minds to make people into good guys or bad guys and then proceed from that point. When a lot of times your perspective is going to change how we look at these different people. Um, we could talk about other examples of this, but we'll get into some of them as we kind of look at your guys' work when you come back to class on Monday. All right, so continuity and change is our uh, next skill. You could look at continuities and changes as not being objective, but in this class, we're going to do it because it's going to help us with progress and decline. So continuities and changes are how institutions, ideas, and problems evolve over time. So one of the things I want us to do to establish just basic facts as we work our way through is to think about what would anybody agree on? Even if I'm a big Michael Jordan homer, which I am, still can't say LeBron didn't win that title in the bubble, and that's pretty important to his legacy. It's difficult. And also now he's like in the conversation points, minutes, all the other things are stacking up for LeBron to make a very compelling argument that he might be the greatest of all time if you were going to start a franchise from day one and have his whole career. He'd be the best team of all time. Ooh, see, you could say that. I think that, like, uh, balls that, uh, that the Warriors did win more regular season games, but that Bulls team won the title. And as Scottie Pippen's <clears throat> shirt said, it don't mean a thing without the ring. No, I don't know. That's how I would answer that argument. But the Warriors were really fun to watch them. I hope they trade Draymond for Carl Anthony Towns. They trade Wiggins, Draymond, Kaminga, everyone else. I think they should just not have Tyson anymore. The Warriors? Yeah. Just trade whole franchise with the Timberwolves? Yeah. They'll just uh, pretend they don't exist? Yeah. <sighs> This is uh, one of the things that is important. This is where like, uh, you could see people from both sides of the political aisle in the last 12 months, depending on what we're talking about. Hashtag facts don't care about your feelings. This is like where my sister, after Trump got elected in 2016, my sister is a very liberal person. We don't see that on, on several things, but uh, she, when she's a big Hillary Clinton supporter. She voted for Hillary Clinton over Obama in the Iowa caucuses in 2008. I know because I was there at the Democratic caucus saw her go for Hillary Clinton. And then when Hillary Clinton became a non-viable candidate, she moved over to John Edwards. It's like, come on, dude. <sighs> Full disclosure, I was working for the Barack Obama campaign at that point in 2008. I've become much more political independently than I was when I was 18 years old, because people change over time. But uh, I was very disappointed. I was like, you're my family. I'm trying to get these votes. Anyway, 2016, Des Moines, Iowa. My sister's living off 56th and Hickman. She throws a giant party, Hillary Victory Party. Invites all of her friends. They had cupcakes. They had a giant cookie that like probably had Hillary's face on it. They were ready for the first female president of all time, and it, instead it just became the saddest Instagram story I've ever seen in my entire life. Because you know they got there, they're like drinking. And she hey. the race. Then like the night goes on, and the story gets more like. All right, well, some of these states aren't going the way we thought. By the end of the night, everybody's just crying. She's terrified. She's sending me texts about how the world's ending. I'm like, I don't know. We've had lots of bad presidents. We'll probably have some more in the future. Maybe just don't take too much stock in like people that don't really care about you and what they're up to. No. We'll talk about the presidency and its importance. Don't worry, it's the United States History 1877 class. We'll also talk about some really bad presidents, Andrew Johnson, bottom of the pile. But this idea of like, no matter how she felt about that outcome, objectively, Donald Trump became president of the United States. He was president for four years, and now, no matter how you feel about it, if you went to Washington, uh, D.C., to Pennsylvania Avenue, went to the White House, now he's not there. I mean, he wasn't there a lot when he was president either. But Joe Biden's hanging out. He is officially the president of the United States, whether you put that on or not. Whether you believe that, uh, like, instead of thinking that, like, when Trump took all those uh, like mailboxes out of all these major urban areas that that had really slow vote counts of mail-in votes, that, like, I don't know, whatever. We don't need to get into that today because we'll get there sometime this semester when we have some research into it. <laughs> but the idea that objective, these should be things that we agree on as principal facts of the situation. Does that make sense? Continuities and changes. Changes, pretty easy to see. We all know a change when we see it, right? School started on Wednesday. That was a change. Continuity, Waldorf's had school. 
since 1903, every single year. A lot of times in history, the, ch the continuities we're going to look at are big systemic things. Like big things that develop over time. Continuities, things like, believe it or not, racism is a part of our history in the United States. Whether that makes you uncomfortable or not, I don't really care, I guess. But like, there's always been racism. There's racism now. There's going to be racism in the future. I can tell you my grandfather was the most racist person I've ever met in my whole life. Like all people, he probably had some of his reasons. He didn't just hate like uh, like minority populations though, he hated other white people with a passion too though. He's Irish, 100% Irish. He hated like Italian people, he hated everyone. And he would tell you about it. Well, he would tell them about it, like he would yell out of his car window, like slurs, and he'd be like, I'd be like seven, be like, Grandpa, that's not okay. Shut up. <sighs> he was tough. <laughs> Some of his views, though, came out of some of his experiences, right? He worked the 1968 Chicago Democratic Convention when Chicago turned into a war zone after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Somebody throws a rock at my head, I might start to hate people like them. I hope not. But that for sure happened to him. Anyway, these big trends in, in, in our history are going to be things we look at that we'll see week to week. And that's how we can see some of these continuities developing over time. Once we have our continuities and changes, then we can talk about progress and decline. This is where we can get subjective, positive or negative changes. Sometimes we want to talk about everything as being progress. We get obsessed with progress and go like, well, everything's going to get better and better and better and better and better forever. We're all going to the top. In reality, eh, things are up and down and back and forth. And no matter what happens, some people are going to feel about certain things in a certain way. I'm like, I can tell you, like, you could throw out any example, and some people will not view it as progress. Like, tomorrow, we're going to beat Briarcliff by 56 points in football. Be progress for us. 1-0. Not good for the Briarcliff fans, though. They're in for another terrible season. Hopefully, we beat them. Otherwise, it'll be a big decline for us, but very positive for them. So maybe we can see it in that lens. But I also want to challenge you because one of the things like because you're going to do this on your exams and sometimes people will like take topics and we go back to our civil rights example. I would have a lot of students write, well, the Montgomery bus boycott was progress, you know, desegregation, very good for everybody. It's like, I guarantee you those Ku Klux Klan members did not view that positively. Maybe another way to think about this is like anybody ever done anything good in their life, achieved anything? Yeah, we've all done stuff. You're all here in this room, so you must have some successes behind you you wouldn't be in college, wouldn't be doing the things that you're doing. When you found success, have you ever like noticed that like you don't have to look that far to find the haters? Yeah, yeah those people are out there, right? You can do the greatest things in the world and people just go like, yeah, you should have like uh, had your arm chopped off first though, would have been way harder. And that's one of the ways I think about progress and decline is like, I know that like there's always gonna be people that look at anything that happens and they'll be like, but actually, this is terrible. I don't know. That's uh, one of the things that I think um, we need to keep in mind as we do this. So we got uh, four minutes. We got one skill, which is a difficult skill, but very necessary. Anybody know what movie this is from? To Kill a Mockingbird. Did anybody read that book in high school? Yeah. Still in there. Oh, that's my favorite book of all time when I was a ninth grader. I ruined a student teacher's life. Her name was Miss Reefer. I mean, I maybe didn't ruin her life because her name was Miss Reefer and she was teaching a bunch of ninth graders. We, we had it in for, we made jokes all the time, 420. Um, but Miss Reefer came in and I was so excited. I saw To Kill a Mockingbird was on the syllabus and if you guys haven't picked up on it, pretty nerdy, always like to read books and that was my favorite one. So every day I showed up just ready to go. And she maybe had like skimmed it, like, you know, getting the stuff in order, throws out the questions, and I'm like trying to answer every question. I made her life terrible. I'm sure of it because I've talked to her about it now because she's married to one of my dad's former players. And like, her last name's Brand now. So Mrs. Brand may be friendlier than Miss Reefer. But uh, the idea that um, I love this book. And one of the things that stands out to me about it when we think about empty moral judgment is Harper Lee, uh, the great American uh, writer. She wrote in that book through the character Atticus Finch. To paraphrase, uh, you can't really ever uh, know somebody until you get inside their skin and walk around for a while. 
Anybody really judgmental? You don't have to own it. We all are a little bit judgmental. Yeah, you don't want to do it because you look like an asshole, right? Yeah. You're like, eh. But I think we all, we all have to pass judgments every single day on all sorts of different things we're doing. And the only way you're going to be an asshole is if you don't show some empathy first. Try to understand why people do the things that they do and understand who they are. And we have to extend that to people in the past also. This is not me saying Hitler is a good person. But I'm saying like, Hitler is somebody that grew up on the border of Germany and like fought in World War I and then rose to power. Like I can see the train of thought where he did some of the things he did for the greatness of his own country. The nationalism and patriotism can get you fucked up sometimes. And like, you probably shouldn't exterminate six billion people. Did he actually do the great thing for his country though? Because he always wanted to win, but shouldn't he have used the Jews and the Nazis uh, sure. to help him win the war? Take 202, we'll talk all about it when we get to World War II. Maybe a poor example. But the idea of like, I'm not saying like, you should put yourself in Hitler's shoes very often. Eh, probably not. But the idea of like, before we're gonna pass judgment on other people, we should extend them the same grace we'd expect. In the same way that like, I don't know what any of you are going through. You can tell me about it and I'll learn something about it and I'll have a better idea and I'll try to empathize with you. I'll still pass judgment. You can give me all the excuses in the world, but I still gotta give you a grade at the end of the day based on the work you're doing. So try to empathize before passing judgment. We're gonna practice this over and over again. For the first time, we're gonna do it on Monday. So, two pages, use these six skills. We got questions? We have to have questions. No, we got it all figured out? At least we can give it a shot. Yeah, do watch your three sources. But like, as far as like format and stuff in your sources, to be honest at this point, because I haven't given you anything related to citations, if I can find what you're using and understand what it is, that's good enough for me. Build your own credibility by doing it right though. Citationmachine.net is a real thing. Just build the citation. I don't care what format you use because you're all majoring in different things. But uh, I will see you on Monday. Support each other. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, and I will uh, see you back here on Monday. We'll talk about